Welcome to Pirate TV. Today we're talking with Harvey Wasserman. And I'm sure that Harvey is a well known quantity to most people that watch Free Speech TV. I've been watching you for years. You're a journalist, historian, teacher, book publisher, talk radio host, and eco activist, as well as a father of four daughters. Hi. Hi. A, I've got five. That's an old one. Five? Oh, wow. I have five daughters, yes. Yeah, you must be a, a master psychologist. <laughs> I, I am the Tevya of the No Nukes movement. Let's put it that way. Uh, you've actually authored, or co authored 21 books. I didn't know that. Well, the most recent is called The People's Spiral of U.S. History. I'll show you a cover. And it, um, hold on here. It, it's just coming out. Uh, anybody who wants it, email me at solartopia at gmail. There it is. It describes U.S. history in terms of cycles, six cycles. So if you want the book, write me, solartopia at gmail, S-O-L-A-R-T-O-P-I-A -A at gmail.com. I started working on this book in 1970. So it's uh, 52 years and it's basically uh, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States 40 years later on acid. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I loved writing it. Uh, it's hard to believe it's done. It's like my bar mitzvah, but I am uh, uh, making it available to the public right now. And I don't have a regular publisher because I didn't want one. Um, not that there would be any corporate publisher that would ever touch this book, but um, you'll be able to understand U.S. history in terms of six cycles. And it's a very radical, progressive, and uh, hopefully fun to read. People tell me it's funny, so I don't know. <laughs> I just wrote what I felt like writing, you know. Um, but uh, people spiral of U.S. history. I think uh, most of you will get a kick out of it. And again, oh, it keeps disappearing. There you go. It's a uh, uh, solar topia at, at gmail.com, S-O-L-A-R-T-O-P-A at gmail.com, or you can go to my website, solartopia.org. Um, but, um, you know, I'm sitting here by the ocean and you're sitting in a high rise. I'm, I'm in a better place than you are. Ed, yeah. but, um, um, and let's talk about, new, let's talk about three things today. Let's talk about nuclear power. Let's talk about um, election protection, which is a very big deal. And then we'll come back to my uh, people's spiral of U.S. history, if you don't mind. And it's one of the fundamental books in my life, actually changed my life. There's been a few books that have done that. Well, but, uh, I'll tell you a story. Um, when I, I was, um, I graduated from the University of Michigan in 1967. I had a BA in U.S. history and journalism. And then I went to the University of Chicago to get a, a allegedly get a PhD. Uh, getting a PhD from the University of Chicago was like getting through the death camps in World War II. I mean, it just took forever and you're lucky you survived. So um, um, uh, I decided uh, very humbly uh, at the age of about 24 that I would write my own history of the United States. And I, I wound up on a hippie farm in Massachusetts, in, the, in, ru in rural Massachusetts, beautiful Western uh, uh, part of the state. And I was holed up in a garage I had tons of books because my uncle owned a bookstore in Boston and he would give me all these free books. So I started writing and I, I fell into a rabbit hole between 1860 and 1920. Uh, it was all the wobblies and the union movement and the populist farmers and uh, all that great stuff. And also the hippies, there were, you know, people but before World War I were taking uh, peyote, uh, you know, white people in the cities and bohemians. Uh, was an early phrase, um, um, you know, uh, precursing queen there. But um, uh, I, I couldn't get out of the period between 1860 and 1920. And I wrote a couple hundred pages and no, uh, no publisher would take it except there was some interest in Harper and Rowe. And in the meantime, I got a letter from Howard Zinn. Um, I, he was a wonderful guy. He was at Boston University. I'd never met him, but I sent him the uh, pages that I'd written. And he wrote me back a letter on a single sheet of yellow paper saying he liked the book and he hoped it would get published. 
So I showed the letter to Harper and Rowe, and this is in 1970 or 71. And uh, they said, they said, the guy looked at me, he said, you know, we don't understand your book at all. It makes no sense. But if, if you'll, uh, if Howard Zinn will write an introduction, we'll publish it. And um, it was basically, my title was A People's History of the United States, 1860 to 1920. So they made a deal, they, they bought the book and, and they paid Howard and he wrote an introduction, but they, they didn't want to call it a people's history of the United States, 1860 to 1920. Uh, they thought that was too boring and too Marxist. And, they, and, and especially, I mean, who am I, a 20, 24 year old grad school dropout? Uh, who's, who am I to write a people's history of the United States? So one day they, the sales manager stuck his head in the door and he said, uh, Harvey Wasserman's History of the United States. And I said, man, you can't do that. That's really embarrassing. And he said, <laughs> I, I still try to discern the meaning of what he said to me. He said, Harvey Wasserman, that's the kind of name all you hippies really like. I mean, what does that mean? I don't know. But they published it, uh, Harvey Wasserman's History of the United States with a, a foreword from Howard's Inn. And it sold very well, due basically to a, a review it got in Rolling Stone. So, uh, and then, then Hugh Van Dusen, the guy who told me that my book made no sense, went to Howard and they somehow made a deal. And then seven years later in 1979, Howard uh, published with Harper and Rowe, uh, A People's History of the United States. And it sold 2 million copies. Yeah. The, the best selling history of the United States in the history of the United States. Sure, and they, you know, they try to censor it. They don't let it, allow it to be taught in some schools. And I know that Howard Zinn had a hard time finding a publisher just like you. I guess uh, Hugh Van Dusen was a brilliant guy. He was the editor of the paperback division at Harper. And he's there for 50 years. I called him like a few years ago, he was still there. <laughs> oh, hey, Howard, hey, uh, Hugh, what the hell? So, uh, you know, it was, it was a great thing Harper did. And uh, he, Howard told me, uh, um, uh, Hugh told me that Howard's book was the only book in the history of Harper and Rowe that sold progressively more copies every year. Um, you know, that happened until Howard passed away, which I believe was in 1999 or 2000. He was a wonderful guy, Howard Zinn. And yeah. I, I owe him my entire career. And I have the, the in the back of this book, uh, I, I, um, I, I kept the letter he wrote me, that single sheet letter on yellow paper. Uh, I kept it, it's right there. Uh, I kept it for 50 years, that letter, that one piece of paper. And um, in, in sometime a few years ago, uh, UMass uh, took all my papers in Amherst. And that was the number one paper I gave him. And I said, the first thing you do with my papers, I had like, 35 boxes of papers from all through my life. I said, the first thing you do is you scan this letter and put it online. So if any of you are remotely interested, the letter that Howard Zinn sent me in 1970, that got, that got um, my Harvey Wasserman's history of the US published and then led to the people's history of the United States is, is a bit, bit viewable on, online. It, go to the UMass Special Collections Archive and. Uh, type um, Howard Zinn letter to Harvey Wasserman, and, and there it is, you know, so uh, the miracles of modern technology. But they, they, they had no idea what my book was about, but apparently it, be, it was a big hit. Um, uh, I was told it, my, my Harvey Wasserman's history was on the a bookshelf of every radical in America, so who knows. Uh, but uh, so that's how, but then I, I recently, I taught uh, college for uh, 14 years in central Ohio at two colleges. And um, um, then I quit in 2017, right before the COVID. I mean, I was really lucky. And I sat down, I moved to LA and I sat down and, uh, and wrote, spent four years uh, writing the people's, hist people's spiral of US history. I loved every minute of it. And I hope you all like the book. So write me solartopia at Gmail and I'll tell you how to get a copy. Okay, well, uh, you're a pretty prolific writer, and uh, I see that uh, you actually uh, wrote the intro for Abby Hoffman's book, Revolution for the Hell of It, and that came out in 2005? 
I don't know. I, I, I loved Abby Hoffman. Abby yeah. was a wonderful person, really great guy. Taught me so much. He taught me, among other things, that, and everybody should know this, that to be effective in a movement, a social movement, you have to be funny. And you can't be boring. The cardinal sin of, of grassroots organizing is being boring. So never, ever be boring. I still haven't dealt with that Abby's passing. I will say that um, if, if you never met Abby Hoffman, um, the, 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 the movie that was made, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, it was okay. It had a lot of problems, you know, like anything else. But the guy who played Abby, Sasha Baron Cohen, really understood Abby Hoffman. It was almost freaky to see that movie, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, and look at Sasha Baron Cohen playing Abby. He was so much like Abby <laughs> that I, I actually called Abby's former running mate, uh, Johanna Lawrence. And I, I said, you know, is it just me or did this guy really get Abby? And she said, no, no, he was, he was right on. So any of you are curious, it's, it's a worth, the movie's worth watching, but if you really wanna know Abby Hoffman, take a look at The Trial of the Chicago Seven. It's an un, uncanny um, uh, portrayal of Abby. Yeah, well, uh, you began to research on atomic power in 1973. Right. And uh, you were among very few journalists that investigated that, Three, three Mile Island, up close and personal. And then well, one of your books was Killing Your Own, The Disaster of America's Experience with Atomic Radiation. So anyway, so, what was it that got you into that? Was it Three Mile Island? That got no, you into here's how it happened. Uh, I was involved in, uh, I, I've been a leftist all my life. My parents were New Deal Kennedy liberals. My parents were both born a mile and a year from John Kennedy in Boston. So they were, in, and they were New Dealers and New Frontier people. And they said, my parents, the key to a great life is to either have great parents or be a great parent. And uh, the, the, the only thing, I, I have five daughters. I have more grandchildren than I can count. And um, uh, the, the key to parenting and the key to the future of the human race is very simple. Hug your children. That's the only thing I knew about parenting. I said I had, I had, I said I had no business being a parent. Um, uh, but uh, I knew Benjamin Spock and I knew that he said in his book, that you know, baby in child care that uh, hug your hug your children, and he also had a great line in there about parenting. He said, "You know more than you think you know." So uh, my parents were very affectionate, very physically affectionate, and then there was a a study done because Dr. Spock in 1946 wrote that you should be affectionate. Believe it or not, that was controversial in 1946. A lot of people advocated that um, you know you should not be affectionate to your children or you spoil them and blah, blah, blah. And uh, of course, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that explains Donald Trump. So, yeah. uh, you know, this guy should have been hugged. And if you know anything about his father, that wasn't gonna happen. His father was a horrible, Donald Trump's father was a horrible man, horrible. And he was yeah. raised by Roy Cohn, who was even worse. So, um, uh, you know, the one thing I've known about raising my children, and they all turned out great, is that we hugged them and we hugged them nonstop. And, and so uh, at any rate, so I was always a liberal. And um, <laughs> one of the great ironies is when I was in junior high in ninth grade, I got a copy of a book called Our Friend the Atom by Walt Disney, which was a big PR piece for nuclear power. And I got it from my bar mitzvah. And I used it from a report I did in ninth grade on nuclear power. And then I didn't think about it. And if you'd asked me at any time between 1959 and 1973, what I thought about nuclear power, I would have told you it was great. But in 1973, I was living on a hippie farm. It came out of a liberation news service, which is a radical news service. There's a wonderful movie about it, by the way. We were broken up by the FBI. And you can see this movie, it's called um, under the ground, uh, the whatever of Liberation News Service it was uh, funded by PBS. Um, and it's a, it's a really cool movie. Uh, just Google Liberation News Service 
and documentary film. And uh, so we were broken up by the FBI in 1968. And uh, for various reasons, we wound up on this magnificent dairy farm in Western Mass. And we were living there, a bunch of hippies, you know, all the, all the stories about the hippie farms are true. It was really, really fun to be on this farm. And uh, we were, we, the first, well, the first ma- we didn't make many joint decisions. We didn't have like meetings and stuff. And you know, we just had dinner and we talked and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, and the first decision we made on this farm was to for- farm organically. We said not to use chemicals. It was a big deal, actually. We actually helped pioneer for the baby boom generation, um, you know, organic farming. But then we, um, and, and at the end, I'll never forget this. One day, the end of uh, December, 1973, we had no idea this was gonna happen. We picked up the local paper, the Greenfield Recorder, and on the front page, there was an aerial photograph of the Montague Plains, which is a flat, sandy area four miles from our house on the Connecticut River. And they superimposed a, a, an artist rendition of a twin nuclear power station, two reactors. And we just looked at the scene and says, no way. No, we're not going to let this happen. We never had a meeting to discuss the pros and cons of nuclear power and coal and blah, 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 and the climate, radioactive waste and radiation and all. We never did that. We all looked at the picture and we says, we are not going to let them build this thing. And um, a primary um, consideration was non-nuclear. We just didn't want this giant industrial facility in our town four miles from our house. Screw that, you know. So, uh, but I, <laughs> because I'd done the report in ninth grade, I was already an expert on nuclear power. I knew everything, of course. So, um, uh, and it turned out that the book we were using as our guide to organic farming came from the Rodale Press. Rodale was a family in Pennsylvania and they were pioneers. Uh, They had been um, in the electronics business. They made some money. They bought a big place in Pennsylvania and they set up a a mecca for organic farming. And they produced this book organic gardening and farming handbook, which we were using to figure out how to plant gardens and stuff like that. Most of us were city or suburban kids. And they published a book called Poisoned Power by a magnificent human being named John Goffman, who had been head of the uh, uh, health division at the Atomic Energy Commission, and then did a study that showed that nuclear power was killing 32,000 people a year. And they basically purged him for doing that. And so we read that book too. And we started a campaign and we stopped that nuclear plant. The nuclear power plant that was proposed for the Montague Plains four miles from our house, they never got the bulldozers in. You know, we were just a bunch of hippies on the hill, but most of us had been active in the, in the movement against the war in Vietnam and for civil rights and for marijuana, as a matter of fact. And so, hey, we stopped them. It wasn't just us, but, you know, and we coined the phrase, no nukes. This is one of the very first no nukes. This T-shirt is, is uh, uh, probably 40 years old. It dates back to 19, the 70s, 50 years old. So um, at any rate, um, so I became, and uh, Sam Lovejoy and other people from our farm became totally focused on stopping nuclear power. And uh, we went all over the country. All these alliances were formed. We had big demonstrations at Seabrook in New Hampshire, and we stopped many, many, many nuclear power plants from being built. In 1974, when we were just getting going, Nixon <clears throat> came on TV, national TV, said there'd be a thousand nuclear plants in the US by the year 2000. And in the year 2000, there were 104. And those 896 nukes were either shut or didn't get built because of the no nukes movement. Anybody ever doubts the ability of an activist contingent to make change, look at what happened to the nuclear power industry. So now, you know, long story short, um, I am, and everybody else who knows anything about nuclear power, we are all petrified about what's going on in Ukraine because there are 15, one five, 
active reactors in Ukraine. All of them are shut, but they're they're still like technically you know operable. Twelve of the fifteen reactors in Ukraine were built by the Soviets uh, and opened before the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. So you have fifteen reactors in Ukraine that are all bigger than Chernobyl and that um, are all more than 30 years old. It's terrifying. I mean, Putin could sneeze and cause a major catastrophe at one or all of these nuclear plants. I mean, if Putin goes really nuts and decides that he wants to wipe out the human race, which as best we can tell is not out of the question that he would do this, all he's got to do is do tiny things at um, uh, uh, any of these reactors or all of them in Ukraine, and he could create a radioactive cloud that would seriously jeopardize the ability of the human species to survive on this planet. That's how bad it is. And that's why one of the obvious reasons why we have absolutely no business building nuclear power plants. And just no um, a sense to it whatsoever. And, and so, and especially, and I'll tell you this, and let you get a word in edge once. When we first started, people would say, well, if you don't want nuclear power, if you're saying no nukes, where are we going to get the energy? And we said, uh, wind, solar. We had no idea what we were talking about. And, you know, we just, it just seemed logical. And the bottom line is that the wind and solar industries, it's not even a curve, it's a straight line, straight up. Everything about wind and solar has exceeded expectations in terms of in cost effectiveness, lack of environmental impact, all these uh, job creation, uh, basic economics. Uh, wind and solar are virtually miraculous and they are the future of the human race, both the ecology and the environment, uh, as well as the, our genome, you know? And, and so there's absolutely no idea, uh, no reason why um, we can't go 100% to wind and solar. Two additional things have jumped in that we didn't know about at the time, batteries, and batteries you know, are a big, big deal. You know, they say, oh, the wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine. Uh, you know, Mazel Tov, you, you figured that out, brilliant. Uh, you know, get your Nobel Prize. I mean, the, the reality is that wind and solar balance each other, but with batteries, you've got permanent storage and you can, you can have 100% of your supply. And then there's something that came out completely out of the blue, which is LED lighting. I mean, 10 years ago, nobody ever heard of LED lighting. And all of a sudden, here it comes. It's cheap, it's clean, it's efficient. It can, you can do little colored things for like when you're on acid. I mean, you know, it's just an, an incredible uh, of four horse people of, of the non-apocalypse. So we have everything we need to shut down all the nuclear plants, all the coal burners, all oil and gas, what I call King Kong, coal, oil, nukes, and gas. They are done technologically. We just got to get these corporations out of the way. And if, if Ukraine and what's going on there, I mean, he took over, Putin took over six reactors right away. And then they took over, they took over Chernobyl. The reason they took over Chernobyl is because it's a massive dead zone. There's a many tens of square miles where there's no people. And so if you've got an army and you're marching from the Belarusian border to Kiev, or well, now they call it Kiev, but you know, when back way back when it was Kiev, they they could they can march those soldiers right through and not encounter any human beings. So military it looked really appealing, but the fact of the matter is that place is really, really, really radioactive. And the troops that were marching, the Russian troops marching through uh, Chernobyl got sick right away. I mean, they, you know, it's just a matter of days. They started showing radiates, radiation sickness. So as best we can tell, the Russians uh, left Chernobyl. Which yeah. is that was exposed in The Guardian yesterday. And uh, I think the Democracy Now! has it on today. But uh, the, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because I wanted to get an update on all of this. And uh, that's one of the things that's happened. But also the last I heard is that the Russians uh, moved in and took over those six reactors. And then they 
they shut off the power. So they were using the auxiliary diesels. And uh, then there was a there was also a firefight in one of those places. And uh, we don't know who what actually happened. Some reports, you know, that uh, the Russians were responsible. Some reports were that it was the Azov battalion and that they were fighting against the Azov battalion that were there occupying that plant. So at any rate, uh, are, are those power plants uh, still on auxiliary power or you know, have they who restored knows? power? Who really knows? I can tell you right now that it's the most dangerous situation in the history of the human race, at least since the Cuban Missile Crisis. The fact that, you you know, there's way more radi residual radiation in these reactors than in many atomic bombs. The Fukushima, the four explosions of Fukushima have released more radioactive cesium into the ecosphere by a factor of more than 100 than was released at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I mean, you gotta understand these reactors, year after year after year, they accumulate radioactive material, which is really, really deadly. And so even Chernobyl, Chernobyl, the, the explosion at Chernobyl, by the way, you may really wanna get a sense of what happened at Chernobyl. <clears throat> the HBO series, it's a five part series called Chernobyl about what happened there. And there's some, you know, they take some liberties. It's a docudrama, basically, but it's devastating. And if you really want to get a sense of what happened there, you should see the series. I watched it over three nights, which was a mistake because I couldn't sleep. I mean, I've been doing this a long time. And I couldn't sleep after watching this. What The way to do it is you get up in the morning, 10, 11 in the morning, and you watch all five. Uh, it's about eight hours. It's the only way to do it. And you, you, anybody who's really serious about the issue needs to see this. You know, there's a- Say, a, say it again. It's, it's the HBO series on Chernobyl. And absolutely everybody should see it. There's a, there's a female character uh, played by Emma, Emily Watson, who's she's really good. Um, not Emma Watson from um, uh, Hogwarts, but Emily Watson from um, Sins of the Father with Daniel Day-Lewis. So um, uh, uh, she is fabulous, but she's actually a composite character. But it, you get a real sense of how horrendous and how insane what happened at Chernobyl really was. And, and you have to understand that the radiation from Chernobyl uh, killed over a million people. And people yeah. are arguing about this, but there was a study done that was released in, in Russia in, in uh, 2007 and in English 2009 done by three Russian scientists. And, they calculated that by that time, 985,000 people had died worldwide from the radiation from Chernobyl. The radiation came to the United States. It was detected in New England and on the West Coast within 10 days. And then it came back again. So, you know, uh, this is the apocalypse here. The idea, any one of these reactors could blow up at any time. They don't have to be attacked. They, uh, they, need, they need a water for coolant. They need power for backup. They need the control rooms to work. These control rooms are old, obsolete. I mean, they're pre-digital for God's sakes. The 12 Soviet reactors in Ukraine are pre-digital. They upgraded them and there's computers now and all that stuff, but you know, they were built before um, uh, they, they, they were computerized with advanced technology. So this is beyond dangerous. Yeah. This is the, the people that actually manage them are getting old too. Well, not only that, when at Chernobyl, um, there's a crew at Chernobyl that has to be there. there. There's equipment that has to be used to keep the the, the core. There are four cores there. Um, one blew up and the other three, uh, the last reactor at Chernobyl ch closed in 2000. And um, uh, they, they require full-time maintenance. And when the Russians came in and took over the place, they kept that crew working at gunpoint. These guys had no food, no sleep. They were cold and they had to stand and run this thing day after day after day. It was insane. When they finally got a crew change, it was front page news in the New York Times. 
you know, at least the Times had some understanding of the gravity of the situation. But the, re the reality is that we are in incredible danger. And, you know, it's hard to tell the Ukraine that shutting the reactors doesn't end the problem. You know, I mean, you still got radioactive waste, you got hot cores, you got the whole deal. But, um, uh, uh, you know, the Ukraine gets uh, uh, between 40 and 50% of its electricity from these reactors. So shutting them is not an easy answer because you black out the place, the hospitals go down, people can't get heat, they can't get light, the refrigeration is gone. You know, it's an incredible nightmare. And I will tell you this without any hesitation, if Ukraine had been 100% powered by wind and solar, this war would not have happened. This is an energy war. You know, it's about gas, it's about pipelines, coal, all that stuff. And, um, and Putin could never have threatened the future of the human race by threatening to blow up a couple of windmills or solar panels. And the reality is that that's why this war is happening, because Ukraine built nuclear plants instead of wind and solar. And the same is true everywhere. Germany, thankfully, um, when Fukushima happened, Angela Merkel, who actually has a brain, um, uh, uh, shut, uh, announced a plan to shut all 19 reactors in Germany. And this past December 31st, which is my birthday, they shut three of the last six. So there are only three reactors remaining in Germany. And um, let's hope they shut. And uh, we only have two in California, which is the fifth largest economy. Germany's the fourth. So, you know, if we can get to fourth. And, and Germany went very aggressively ahead on wind and solar. But, you know, they're late. Late to the late to the fair here, and um, uh, uh, everybody's got to go. The only way, the only way, the only way that the human race survives is to go 100% to wind and solar. All these people are saying that nuclear helps with fight global warming. I mean, are you crazy? A, a nuclear plant burns at 571 degrees Fahrenheit. How do 414, which is how many reactors more or less there are on the planet? How do 414 radioactive fires burning at 571 degrees Fahrenheit cool the earth? You tell me. It doesn't. And so, you know, they all got to shut. We're going to go 100% renewable as fast as we can. And there will be bumps in the road, but with batteries and LED and the other technologies, uh, we can do it. And we have no choice. Yeah, well, we covered this quite a lot on Pirate TV. And uh, when those reports that you were talking about came out about a million people being killed, uh, we had that on Free Speech TV and TV also. But, um, you know, nobody knows that, you know, that that's been covered up. You know, very few people know that a million people well, died. You know, I know, that's a start. <laughs> yeah, we know about it. But... Your, your, your viewers know, so, you know. Yeah. It's not like it, it's nobody. What are, what are we potted plants? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, we're the most important people, <laughs> I guess. But at any rate, um, uh, so uh, you just wrote an article uh, and it was published in RSN, uh, Reader Supported News, and it was called Nuclear Power at the Brink of Bankruptcy, War and Apocalypse. And you're talking about a lot of these issues that you just went over just now. I mean, there's enough wind power in Russia, you know, to take us all to the moon, for God's sakes. So, um, and there's plenty of wind in, in Ukraine. I've been there. It's, it's a windy place. It's a great part of, and, and then you got America. You got, you got offshore um, in the Atlantic coast, the Pacific coast. You got the Great Lakes, which are enormously um, potentially powerful. Um, and, and, uh, and you got plenty of solar. Um, every rooftop in the world, with a few exceptions, if you got trees and stuff, uh, should have solar panels on it. That's the solution. That's the solution both to uh, employment and to the environment and to the economy. I mean, it's a great irony. Uh, makes you believe in nature that the solution to our uh, ecological and economic dilemma is, is ecologically sound which is wind and solar. I mean, you got bird problems, absolutely. Well, and let me ask you this, which is more easily solvable? Windmills that kill birds or plutonium 
that's de deadly for 250,000 years. Uh, in okay. fact, uh, you know, <laughs> most, most um, windmills, big windmills are three blades into the wind. And most of them are painted white. And they just cut, they did an experiment. I think it was in Denmark. And they took one of the blades, one of the three blades and painted it black. And bird kills dropped by 40% after that. So I think there are solutions to the bird kill problem. And uh, you know we have uh, challenges with uh, cobalt and lithium and some other rare, me rare earth metals um, with the solar panels, but uh, that's going to be solvable too, I'm sure. So long before we solve the problem with plutonium, we will solve the problem with uh, with rare minerals and, and, sol and solar panels and batteries. The big money is behind these nuclear plants, but they uh, most of them never get built. Like, you know, I live in Washington where we got screwed by whoops, right? right. And I think they only ended up building one of those plants and we're still paying for all the other ones. And uh, then you got people like uh, Bill Gates that are supporting these small modular reactors, right? Which uh, you point out are actually maybe more dangerous. Uh, Want to talk about that a little bit? Well, I think I'd like to write a, 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 an article with a banner headline. It says, is Bill Gates stupid? I mean, you know, small modular reactors are ridiculous. We, we've already had uh, one of them blow up at Santa Susana in California. And um, we had a sodium cooled reactor at Fermi One in Michigan, 1966, that caused us to almost lose Detroit. And uh, they're not gonna work. It's just a scam. And, uh, you know, every dollar spent on small modular reactors is ten dollars that should have gone into renewables and i don't know what this guy is thinking or what his problem is um uh steve jobs accused him of not taking enough acid but um bill gates denied that and said he did take acid so I, I won't get into that one but you know the bottom line here is that there is it's a complete scam uh, a new generation of reactors big or small is utterly insane uh, we have 93 reactors in the United States. There are there are operable. Um, I believe it's going to go down uh, this month uh, um, in Michigan. I think one or two reactors are going to shut. But um, uh, so maybe we'll get closer to 90. But it's way too many. There's uh, over 400 worldwide. They're all disasters. They're all catastrophes. They're all um, uh, could explode as we're interviewing here. Uh, you know, we had four explode. The four that exploded at Fukushima uh, were American design. You know, when for decades, when we started the movement, the no nukes movement, the industry would say, oh, no, 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 nuclear reactors cannot, it's a physical impossibility that a commercial reactor could explode. So then Chernobyl exploded. And they said, oh, no, 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 that's a Soviet reactor. Then in 2011, four American design reactors at Fukushima blew up and so now they don't deny anymore that american reactors can explode so there's two reactors left under construction in the u.s they're in volto in georgia uh they were originally supposed to come online years ago for 15 billion dollars now they're 30. Now, and now they're over 30 and there's not clear they're going to open by the way yeah it's really not clear they're going to open these things could bankrupt that state yes well you already had next door in south carolina you had two reactors built at VC Summer that were abandoned for $10 billion and they threw one of the corporate guys in prison. You know, um, I hope they fill the prison uh, from Vocal. It's ridiculous. And of course, the first guy to go would be Obama. If Obama okayed an $8.3 billion interest-free loan, guaranteed loan for uh, uh, Vocal. And, it's money down the tube. And then uh, 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 Trump came in and threw in another 2.7. So they got up to 12 billion and the thing is coming in uh, at 2030 and not, not clear it's ever gonna open. And one thing we know for sure, if it does open, the electricity coming from both of will be more expensive than electricity from wind or solar. So what the, what's the point? Really? Uh, it's, it's, the point is for those guys to make money. But, well, you, you, gotta know, remember, uh, now, you, 
you got to look at one thing now. We are nearing the point where the wind and solar industry is worth more than the, the coal, oil, nuke, and gas industry. In, in California, we have more people working in solar than there is working in coal in the whole country. More than 50,000 people in, in uh, California working in wind and solar. So, you know, and you know what the number one state for wind power is? By far. Texas. Bigger than the other three combined, the next three. Texas. Yeah. yeah. Texas, West Texas, you know, when they first started selling nuclear, they said, oh, it's going to be too cheap to meet it. Yeah. And in fact, we now have electricity that's too cheap to meet. But it's not from nukes, it's from wind power. Because at night in West Texas, in the winter, when those windmills are really whooping, they have more electricity on the grid that they can handle, and they give it away. So if you're living in West Texas in certain areas, you can, at night, run your TV, your VCR, whatever it is, your, your washing and dryer machines, your, you can charge your car, you can fill your battery for free. They, can't, they, don't, they don't charge at night in many places in Texas. So, you know, and it, at some point, relatively soon, the wind and solar, which are, wind and solar are growing, you know, faster than any other form of energy, you know, in the world. Nothing is growing faster than these two industries, along with batteries and LED. So um, at some point, those industries are going to have more money, certainly in the coal industry. And, and, uh, and soon thereafter in, uh, in, in oil and gas. Well, there was just a couple of things I wanted to interject about this. And uh, so, you know, I go out and videotape these presentations and everything. And uh, I've re taped a lot of debates between pro-nuclear and anti-nuclear people put on by the Physicians for Social Responsibility and different organizations like that. And uh, one thing that I wanted to point out is that nuclear is not green energy because it takes way more carbon to to mine that uranium and process it and you know build those plants and haul all that stuff around you know which is not usually taken into the calculation and it takes 30 years to build them so uh we'll already be back in the stone age by then well all these idiots that are pushing small nuclear never tell you that they can't have anything like a fleet of small nuclear plants until 2030. Uh, I mean, what's the point? And I guarantee you a, a thousand percent uh, that, that, that the electricity from small modular reactors will be way more expensive than wind and solar, and certainly more expensive than increased efficiency, you know, which is by far the cheapest form of electrical enhancement. So, you know, it, it, it's utterly insane what they're trying to do. It makes no sense whatsoever. People say, oh, what about thorium? There aren't any thorium reactors. And the thorium reactor is scheduled to, to burn at 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Then they say, oh, what about fusion? Fusion, which is every 10 years, fusion is another 10 years away. And it, it's supposed to burn at 100 million degrees. What are we supposed to do? Bring the sun down to the earth? to help cool the earth does that make sense i don't think so it's, it's actually this, hotter than the sun it's hotter than the center of the sun yes it's insane ridiculous and it does produce tritium or whatever so people are talking about these uh, new reactors like they exist they don't exist it's a pipe dream and, and we, we know i guarantee you 100 percent that of the small of the of the big light water reactors never another one it's not going to happen. And the, the idiots in the other countries around the world that are building them are building them for nuclear weapons. They're not building them for power. And yeah. uh, everybody knows at this point that the future belongs to wind and solar. The question is, when are, when are the wind and solar industries going to yeah. exert sufficient political pressure? You're starting to see it. I mean, there's 50,000 people in California working in the solar business. It's one, it's one of the biggest employers in the state of California. So what, are they going to kill uh, the jobs of 50,000 people? The biggest problem uh, that we face with solar is the unions. 
uh, because the, the solar business is not unionized and it needs to be. And that, that, that's what has to happen now. And, that, and once we have the unions with us and the solar industry starts spending its, some of its money on political stuff, uh, you know, why isn't Joe Manchin being bought by the renewable energy industry? You got all these uh, mountains in West Virginia where they blew the tops off. You can put windmills up there. It's not a problem, you know, and they, they'll do just fine. They'll create more electricity than coal does at, at this point. And it'll be cheaper, safer, cleaner, more reliable, more job producing, all that stuff. And, uh, well, you know, we know how much Joe likes money. Somebody just go in there and buy him, for God's sakes. Yeah. It's a problem that we've been investigating on Pirate TV. It's, you know, you hear about the oligarchs that run Russia and the oligarchs that run Ukraine, but the United States is run by oligarchs too. Right. And uh, it's this oil, you know, oligarchs like the Coke network and all that, you know, they own the whole Republican party and they own Manchin and cinema. And you gotta know, you gotta know one thing. Putin, Trump, um, uh, Tucker Carlson and Steve Bannon are all the same person, right? Have you ever seen them all together? <laughs> so, you know, these guys are um, uh, uptight, old, male chauvinist, misogynist, racist, violent, unloved, unhugged um, uh, autocrats. It's all the same deal. And they hate renewables for the same reason they hate democracy. And remember, the one thing these guys hate the most, aside from uppity women who terrify them, the, the one thing that these guys hate the most is democracy. Yeah. They all hate democracy. Yeah. So I run a weekly Zoom call. Um, um, I co-convene it. It's called the Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition. And you can email me about it. I'll send you the link. Solartopia at Gmail. I'll send you the link. It's every Monday uh, at 5 p.m. Eastern. We go about an hour and a half. And um, uh, we talk about election issues, and we're gonna, we've just expanded it. It's now going to be the Green Greep or the Gree Gree uh, calls because we're going to talk about more and more about uh, environmental issues as well. And, um, uh, you know, these guys are doing everything in their power to kill democracy in, in Russia, in Ukraine, and here in the United States. And, and they, because they know. And Donald Trump said it best. He said, basically, if you have fair elections in this country, no Republican will ever get elected again. I mean, this country is more than 50 percent under the age of 40. The millennial and the Zoomer um, uh, generations are more than half the country. And they are the two. They are the most progressive, most socially tolerant, most culturally aware uh, generations in human history. A lot of people are comparing right now justifiably the political situation in the United States with Germany in 1939. And the reality is you do have a Nazi party in the Republican party. These, these people are Nazis, no doubt about it. And you also have a weak Weimar, wimpy, spineless opposition in the Democratic party, which is utterly worthless, uh, controlled by the corporations. The difference between Germany in 1939 and the United States in 2022 is that the people are on our side. In Germany, the, the German people went for Hitler. He was popular. And um, what he stood for was popular. Not a majority, but there were enough people to support him. In the United States, no. You know, those of us who are called socialists and, and leftists, in fact, we support the progressive movement in this country. Everything that we support is supported by the majority of the American public. You know, more than 60% of the American people want Medicare for all. They want free education, free higher education. They want to end homelessness, end poverty, end hunger, uh, you know, uh, save the environment, convert to renewables, all uh, legalize marijuana. For God's sakes, the polls now are showing 90% in favor of legalizing marijuana nationwide. I mean, come on, you know, so, all the things that we started fighting for in the 60s and are fighting for now, we're supported by the American public. That wasn't the case in Germany in 1939. These progressive views were not tolerated. But in America 2022, 
As I say, you've got a Nazi party, you've got a Hitler, and then uh, you have a Weimar uh, Democratic Party, which is utterly wimpy and worthless. But the public, especially the young people, I mean, uh, uh, support us and support all these things. They want to call me a socialist. I'll say, well, okay, I'm, I'm really a solar topian, and that, that, that's a different discussion. But um, okay, what is modern socialism? Is it Medicare for all? Yes. Is it supported by 60% of the American public? Yes. Is it free college education? Yes. Is it cancellation of student death? Yes. Is it ending homeless and poverty, homelessness and poverty and hunger? Yes. All those things. So, you know, don't be shy about supporting 100% renewables. Um, the public wants it. We're just saying what the public wants. I mean, in many ways, Bernie is just a middle of the roader. You know, he's a New Deal Democrat, basically. Sure. And, and so, you know, here we are. And uh, uh, I'm prepared to win. So we have to, we have to fight for free elections, number one. We have, and basically, we're fighting for democracy, both in our elections and in our energy supply. Because the reason that corporations hate renewables, those, those who aren't in the business, and there are many corporations now in the renewable business, but the reason that the coal, King Kong, coal, oil, nukes, and gas hates renewables is because it's democratized. You know, it's on rooftops. It's, it's community-owned wind power. These are yeah. things that the public can control and, uh, and batteries. Yeah, anybody can put a battery in their house now. Anybody can switch to LED lighting and cut your, you know, your use uh, uh, to a quarter of what it was before. So we have all this stuff. Um, um, we can have organic gardening and farming. We can have uh, uh, an end to plastics. We have a, uh, the technology to do all that stuff. What's standing in the way is this cancerous blood clot called the corporation. And that's, and that's why these guys hate the government, by the way. It's not that they're anarchists or believe in democracy and direct control, libertarian control by the public. What they hate is something that can fight the corporations. These guys are pro-corporate is what they are. And, uh, and the government is the corporation or should be the corporation of the people subject to elections, which they also hate. Yeah. So um, you've been working with Bob Fritakis, you know, on free press a lot. And uh, I've featured Bob Fritakis talking about elections before, but so you got the show uh, that comes on KPF, KPFK, and uh, I, I actually heard you on uh, Nuclear Hot Seat, I think, oh, good. a couple good. times. The great Levy, how about you? We have a big struggle going on in Pacifica right now at the network. We, we uh, had an election where 55% of the listenership, uh, the supporters, the members of uh, Pacifica supported a... Um, a change in the bylaws and the entrenched power is refusing to go along with that. We, we, we have some serious issues uh, at Pacifica and people have to get involved and fight for democracy at Pacifica because we're being denied democracy at the Pacifica network. And we really need to streamline that network and put it under, uh, make it cease uh, being a dictatorship and, and dysfunctional. Well, I remember the last big fight, you know, when the board isolated themselves and they were going to sell off so it's, it's endless and the problem yeah. is that you have a, a network that should be a leftist network that should be a network that serves the people and it's a tremendously valuable asset uh, for people who believe in democracy uh, both in energy and in elections and it's being denied to us and anybody wants to communicate to me on that i'm at solartopia at gmail s-o-l-a-r-t-o-p-i-a -A at gmail Dot com and you can also write me about my book this <laughs> has a way of disappearing here uh, uh the people's spiral I, there you go the people's spiral of u.s history which i loved writing and you, i hope you like reading solartopia at gmail is my email uh, solartopia.org is the website and your show is called the california solartopia, california solartopia. Show. and also it's at uh, progressive radio network uh, the solartopia green power and wellness show that airs on Thursdays at 5 p.m. Uh, and but the big one is our grief calls, our green grief calls, uh, um, democracy and energy and elections. Uh, we're on every five at 5 p.m. Mondays, 
and email me there and I'll I'll send you the link and also it's it's uh, recorded so it's at uh, uh, grassroots EP G R A S S R O O T S E P for election protection dot org grassroots emergency election protection zoom yeah so um uh it's great to talk to you ed i really appreciate it and um um you know maybe we can talk about election theft uh in more detail another time because that also yeah well talk. i know they're just the republicans are just cranking out all these laws they've cranked out hundreds of them now trying well, to Donald make it hard for people to vote Yes, as Donald Trump said, if there are fair elections in the United States, no Republican will ever get uh, uh, win, or, win again. So they know what they're doing. They have to, if 50% of the country is under the age of 40, and if people under the age of 40 rejected him in 2020 by a margin of 25%, women in the United States in 2020 voted against Trump 58 to 42 so, you know, in the indigenous culture, um, uh, it was a matriarchy. And the women ran the show and the women could remove the chief. And that's essentially what happened in 2020. We had a crazy fascist, lying, mobster, violent idiot as president of the United States and the women removed him. And uh, so they, they need to prevent young people from voting, prevent people from color, of color from voting and um, you know deny women control of their own bodies all that stuff and, and you know we, we fight 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 and uh, it's a hard fight but we have to remember that the american public is with us the american public believes in democracy and it believes in saving the environment and um, uh, is not uh, in favor of nuclear power and uh, all these things we have the public on our side we're not radicals we're mainstreamers at this point in time you know, Bernie, Bernie would be right smack in the middle of the New Deal. Okay, so well, on that, we better end it. We're running out of time. So but come see me at Solartopia. Write me at Solartopia at Gmail. Uh, come see me at Solartopia.org. Uh, get my book, which you'll love, uh, People Spiral. I had way too much fun writing it, and you'll, you'll enjoy reading it. And Ed, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. And I'm glad to come back anytime. Okay, great. We'll do it again.